if I remember, he was dribbling at the mouth, frothing at the mouth, uh, seething, teeth clenched, waving the sword round, thinking that he was a samurai warrior. The sword was four or five feet and dressed probably a bit like like a vagrant, really, uh, and looking particularly dangerous, I have to say. Fear is something which doesn't come to mind. Invariably, you're, you're feeling more anxious because everybody's looking at you to solve this. Uniform police had already put a cordon in around a central London square, which was an area of green grass with metal railings. So I positioned myself directly behind a row of uniformed riot police uh, holding their long perspex shields uh, up in front of them for protection. So there's me on their shoulders uh, and I have to communicate with this individual through them, through the shields, into the distance uh, to this individual, knowing that I'm going to have to shout effectively for them to hear me and dreading the negotiation because you know that when you shout at people you're not going to build rapport with them that quickly maybe if he puts the sword down later on we'll be able to move closer and maybe we can put the shields down but you know initially it's, it's not a good start everyone's looking at you to solve it there is nobody else that's going to solve this really Everyone's looking at the negotiator who's turned up to this incident to get this man to put his sword down, give himself up, walk peacefully towards the police cordon so they can take him away. And- well, there's so much at stake in that job in central London that Martin was called to. I remember it well. You've got risk to the public. You've got a man with a sword, risk to the police officers at the scene. I mean, this is a, a life-threatening situation. You've got an audience because it's the middle of the day and this doesn't happen every day on the streets of London. And everybody is looking at you, nobody else, to bring this to a peaceful end. And by using some simple techniques, a lot of listening and having the confidence to call out exactly what you're seeing or what you're hearing or what you're experiencing, it can actually add to the tools that we all need to have better, more convincing conversations for ourselves, whatever the situation. Worst case scenario for this guy would be either to start injuring himself, um, either with or without the sword, uh, rushing at the armed cordon, breaking through and managing to get to uh, other police officers and all the public and injuring them uh, or me, Um, rushing at the police and being detained, but by being detained, there's injuries to, to him or all the police. Um, all of those, they're, they're injuries. Best case scenario, he puts the sword down and surrenders to police in a peaceful way. And that, that's what our job is, to get him to do that best case scenario. I'm Chris White. That's Martin Richards. We are hostage and crisis negotiators with over 20 years experience each working all over the world. And this is the Convincing Conversations podcast where we want to help you, whatever your situation or background, to have better, more effective conversations with the people around you. So by now, you're probably thinking, how on earth is a swordsman on the loose in London with a big samurai sword threatening everybody going to help me have a better day? So Martin, what is it we're talking about today? So today, Chris, we're going to talk about emotional labelling. And and really, that is, as it sounds, we're going to talk about labeling what we see, what emotions we witness, describe and articulate what the person is conveying in front of us. So calling out and naming those emotions. We dealt with uh, pub fights, uh, marriage, domestic disputes, and no matter what we said to people, they were just so angry that they just wouldn't listen to us. And then what tends to happen is matters we're dealing with it all descends up into uh, descends into a right mess and we end up arresting people for some tuppenny hate me breach of the peace uh, public order um, just because 
the person just wouldn't calm down. And, and such a waste of time, really, because it's it's so easily avoided, isn't it? I mean, even after an argument has started, because if, if you think about it, most arguments spiral out of control and they actually become very quickly about winning and self-esteem <clears throat> and, and, and all that sort of getting one over on another person. It's not just the pub fights either, is it? I mean, I can remember parking, not long, not that long ago, actually, I can remember parking my car in a, um, a residential uh, street. Um, yeah, it was narrow, but there were no parking restric- restrictions. I thought it was all right. But this guy uh, came up to me, he was in his car, uh, window down. He actually had a little boy in the back, which wasn't great, but he was shouting and being really aggressive, saying this was happening all the time. He couldn't get out of his drive and he, and he really kicked off and he was abusive. That situation could easily have got violent. He could have had a weapon in his car. He wasn't a small person. He was bigger than me. Um, and there was no way he was going to listen to me whilst he was in in this angry state. No way. He was, he was way too emotional, probably like your swordsman. Um, now that's not a nice situation to be in, but I, I let him vent, for want of a better expression. Um, I, once he'd stopped shouting at me, I said, I'm sorry this had happened. I didn't mean to cause him a problem. I didn't live in that particular location. Um, and I could appreciate that it must be frustrating every time you try and get out of your drive, you can't. Mm. Um, and, and he actually ended up apologising. The really? truth is, he's, he's probably yeah, he's probably probably quite a nice guy, but um, for whatever reason, you know, what I did caused him caused him to kick off. I think, Martin, it's because I don't know how you feel about this one. It's because when people are really irrational, um, they're highly emotional. I've been there, yeah. um, and when we're emotional, we can't listen. We can't listen. We're not ready to be persuaded. We're 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 on a roll. We're um, reacting to stimulus or s- the, all the different stimuli that are around us. And we're, we're just not ready, are we? We're just not ready to be persuaded to change our mind. And we get really angry when someone says, you know, you're wrong, calm down, blah, blah, blah. So actually, you, you trying to get me to change my mind when I'm really emotional is a, is a complete waste of time because I'm not hearing your words. Yeah, it's like, well, here's an example, a child in a supermarket and you see it time and time again where they can't have what they want. They throw themselves on the floor. They shout and scream. Um, I know my kids did it when they were in their terrible twos, for example. And at that time, um, can we rationalise with them? No. Can we explain to them why they couldn't have that sweet? No. So we have to wait until they get home, and and that's the point when their emotions have dissipated and they've mellowed, and that's the time when you can sit them down and explain why they couldn't have that sweet. So you're right. When the adult version, there is an adult version of that, we don't throw ourselves on the floor and shout and scream when we can't have our own way, but there are emotions there Um Nevertheless, and because there are emotions that are present there and they may be intense inside somebody's um, thoughts, if you like, they can't listen. So it's, it's mm. the same as the child in the supermarket, but the adult version of that, I suppose. Mm. One way to do this is, you know, is to name name the emotion that we're seeing or hearing. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, it's emotional labelling, and that's what we're talking about today. Or the phrase that we use is we name it to tame it, um, which might sound a bit cheesy, but it's easy to remember. Name it to tame it. Call out what's in front of us um, and reflect back to the person that this is what I'm seeing or hearing. Um, so what do I mean by that? It's like you sound and name the emotion, or it seems to me that you are and name the emotion. You look and name the emotion. Now, you can get it wrong. You know, if I if I said to you, it seems to me that you feel uh, betrayed. Now, some might say that's not a true emotion, but go with me on this one. Um, I, I I might be wrong, and, and you might you might sort of bite me back for that, and you might say, "No, Chris, I don't know, where did you get that from? I'm not I'm not feeling betrayed. I'm feeling 
angry, I'm feeling revengeful, I'm feeling let down, or any number of other things. And I might get it wrong, but my my response to you is that I'm sorry I got it wrong, but that's what I was seeing, or that's what I was hearing, that's what it felt like to me. Um, and you will quickly point out that I've got it wrong and tell me what you're actually feeling, what your emotion actually is. So if I get it right, you feel that I'm on your side, if you like, because I'm trying to listen and understand. If I get it wrong, I'm, I quickly learn what it is that you actually are feeling. Um, I'm not judging you. Um, I'm not trying to solve your problem. What I am doing is drawing out the emotion onto the table, if you will, because until we know what the emotion is, we can't deal with it, can we? Well, it sounds great, Chris, but we know that most people would just tell you to calm down. Um, and I despair at some of the police documentaries that I know you've watched as well, where there'd be a fight outside a pub or a disturbance of some sort, and the police rock up. And the first thing they do is they say, all right, everybody, just calm down. And then what and then happens? Watch it, and then watch it kick off. It kicks off mm. straight away. Um, so I suppose telling somebody to calm down is the the opposite of that effort, if you like, of emotional labelling. Mm. Mm. I can understand, you know, that um, what you just said, that so, what will put people off in trying to emotional labelling is that you will get it wrong like you've just said. Mm. Um, and that's one of the reasons I suggest why people don't do it, um, the, the fear of getting it wrong. But as you said, they'll they'll tell you what the emotion is if you get it wrong. Because you're not telling to people, oh, you're not saying that they are upset or they are depressed. As you said, you're saying that they seem depressed or they look upset. So that, if you like, gives you a buffer, um, gives you an excuse, if you like, uh, when they come back at you with a different emotion. Mm. A, a key thing is, is what are we really trying to address? We're not, we're not attacking somebody's personality. We're not saying they are wrong. We're not saying they're being rude. They are being violent. What we're doing is looking at the behaviour and the emotion and separating the behaviour from the person does a really key thing and, and it and it protects their dignity mm. it, it allows their allows them to to keep their self-esteem and, and that's really important because if you if you press the dignity button with somebody who's really highly emotional your swordsman for example um mm. somehow i wouldn't mind guessing that became about maintaining dignity his own um because he's going to have to well hopefully He's going to have to sort of climb down or, or retreat from the situation he's found himself in through what you did. But it, it's just less threatening than saying you're rude or you're acting over the top. Um, we all get emotional angry at times, and it, but it's the behaviour that, that goes out of whack, not the person as they might usually be. So trying to separate the person from behaviour and addressing the behaviour lets them adopt a different position and, and maintain their dignity. Because as I say, you press that you press that dignity button and I guarantee you'll get a negative reaction to it. And then you've got to start all over again. Picking your brains there a bit, um, Martin, what, um, you know, I, I've just said, you know, separating the person from the behaviour and uh, maintaining the dignity. What, what, how would you fail at that? What would you, what would you definitely not do? in order to avoid that going going bad? Um, Personalise it for them, really. So saying things like, you are rude, or you are acting way over the top here. Um, because we all get emotional and angry at times, but it's the behaviour that's out of sync, if you like. It's not the person, it's their behaviour. So we, we try and separate that. So how, how, what, what would you, so, okay, so um, you're being rude, which is a perfectly natural thing for a lot of people to say, you're being rude. Um, how, how would you reframe that and separate the behaviour from the person without being personal? Well, you sound angry. Okay. And what if, okay, what if somebody comes back and says, 
well, yeah, of course I'm angry. You can see I'm angry. Um, you know what? what well, that what, well, that's good because now I've got the emotion. Um, so I've succeeded there. I've called out the emotion, as you said, mm. we've named it. Now I've got that emotion. I can go on to validate it. I can go on to ask questions around it and probe it more. Um, but until I've got that emotion, I can't do any of that. I've got to get it first. I've got to know what it is. Now, if that person came back to me and said, no, I'm not angry. I'm frustrated. Great. Thank you. Now I've got the frustration. Now I know what the emotion is. I can ask about the frustration and I can, can validate that emotion for them. All right. So you you say to me, well, you sound angry. And I say, I'm not, I'm, no, I'm not, I'm not angry. I'm, I'm absolutely fine. Okay. Well, I you say, can... well, you sound, you sound angry. Well, again, they may come back and say, no, 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 I'm fine. Well, mm. well, okay. So then I will go in to ask, and we'll talk about open questions uh, uh, later, mm. but then I'll go on to ask, well, what is it then that is making you do X? Yeah. For example. So mm. I will always follow it up with questions but if the person is, as you said, they, they could just uh, stick their head in the sand, if you like, and just not declare what is an obvious emotion that they're going through, mm. just out of spite, just mm. to be difficult. And we've had those people. You yeah, know, and that's definitely. fine. Yeah. But it, I'll keep making the attempts to call out those emotions because we know that unless we, they're out there, we're not going to deal with this. We're no, not going to get to end game, are we? No, we're not. And you, you mentioned you mentioned validation. I mean, that, that's an interesting word. And it's, it's you know, what, what does it mean? Sometimes people clearly showing an emotion. I know mm. I've had this and I'm sure you have. Um, and they won't actually give you any leeway because they're embarrassed. They're frightened. Uh, they don't know what's going to happen next. They think they're the only person in this position. Um, so, you know, by validating it and by validating, I mean, letting them know that actually it's normal um, sometimes. Um, you know, it's, it's normal to feel a certain way. And once we've listened to somebody and we get their backstory a little bit, very often it's not surprising they feel that way. And by doing that, it sort of gives them permission to feel that getting angry and, fr and frustrated is okay um, because what we're not doing is judging them. We don't have a we don't have a, a contrary opinion um, because, as we know, a key to this is is showing true empathy for somebody else's situation uh, without trying to solve all the problems. And it's hard for people to to actually declare their emotions at times, particularly at work, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Well, we've got that hierarchy thing, haven't you? Um, because I know I've worked in I've worked in places and so have you where you know if you if you admit that you're feeling vulnerable you're feeling frightened you're feeling depressed you know you something is is having a real negative impact on you the minute mm -hmm. you admit that you're you're frightened about the perception that others will will have of you <clears throat> and I've I've probably been as guilty as that as the next person in my life I would think, because nobody ever said to me, you know what, it's okay. It's okay to feel X, Y, and Z because of what you've been through or experienced. And there's lots of that. There's lots of that. Bullying, unfairness, grievances, domestic problems. Um, you know, life is hard. Um, and, it's, and it's difficult, isn't it, for people to admit to something because they think it's going to be viewed as weak, when, when actually it's a brave thing to do, to acknowledge that we're feeling in certain ways. Let me just go back to the swordsman. Um, so re, just give us a quick recap, um, Martin. What, when you were there and you somebody no doubt said, this is a very dangerous situation, can you please get him to put his sword down and so you know nobody gets hurt? What did you, what did you learn about him, through through using the emotional labelling technique? You've used <coughs> others as well. I get that, but what did you actually learn about him? Who, 
Who was his argument with? Why was he raging against the machine? What was going on? Interestingly, if I recall, I don't think we ever got the real story or a story about what he was going through, if you like, or what his beef was, as you call it. Mm. Um, he was just incredibly incoherent and angry. Um, now, yes. And dangerous, presumably. Well, incredibly dangerous, yeah. Um, and I know we've talked about labelling emotions, but what we can also do, and what I did with him, is you can also label observations that you see. So this guy, I remember at one point, um, it was clear that he was thinking about surrendering, putting the sword down by his behavior. And it how could how be, was it clear? What, what, did you, what did you see of his behavior that made it clear? So he, he, he looks a bit tired, for example. He, he decided to sit down at one point. He started um, shaking his head, um, resigned, if you like, shrugging his shoulders, which is different to standing in a warrior samurai pose. Mm. So what I did in that situation is label what I see. And this is called pacing and leading, where we label the facts as we see them. Facts he can't really argue with. And if he does argue with him, then he knows he's lying. You know, as an example, if I said to you now, Chris, you're sitting in a chair talking into a microphone. Yes, you can deny that, but you know that you're being untruthful. And so we label, um, if you like, what we are seeing. Like his voice was getting much quieter. He was holding the sword in a less threatening manner. His arms were down by, by his side. And then by throwing all these labels at him, it's less threatening you're not asking him to do anything. You're drawing his attention to the to the positive behaviours that he's exhibiting. They help to clarify our own thinking, uh, and invariably it draws out you know what the other person is is thinking as well. Um, and we get them get him. We nudge him along, if you like, to an agreement of those facts before we can put some suggestions uh, to him. So, quick question. You've written a book called <laughs> Just When You Think You're Winning. My point is, did you relax at the time when you sensed a change in behaviour? Or was that the time when you thought, there's a shift here, I need to be really, really careful? Because it would be easy for me to think, mm. well, if he looks tired and he's sitting down, it's game over. No, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, you can talk to somebody for three hours and get nowhere. And the moment you get the slightest positive action from them, it, you can feel quite elated that you're getting somewhere. Mm. But in the back of your mind, you know for a fact that that is the time where things start to go wrong mm. because people relax. You get a bit cocky with how great you're doing. The police on the cordon start you know, re relaxing too much and start looking away and chatting amongst themselves. And that's the time when it all goes wrong. I remember there was a an incident I dealt with. There was a guy on top of a roof and we spoke to him for seven hours. And this is a big mistake on my part. And we got him to come down. He came into the flat that we were talking from where his mum resided. Um, we allowed him to hug his mother and then he walked into the kitchen, which we allowed. And then all of a sudden he sprinted towards the window and managed to dive halfway through the window before my swift footed colleague managed to grab hold of his belt around his waist and pull him back in. Now, can you imagine if he managed to go through that window, um, what would have happened to him now after all that hard work that well, seven hours he could talking, have taken he could have taken your colleague with him as well correct and that was solely our fault because we relaxed we thought well we've got him off the roof we've done a great job we've got him in the flat and we didn't put back on our police heads if you like mm -hmm. and thought officer safety never let anyone in the kitchen uh, because obviously the implements that are there um, keep 
keep contain get, keep this guy contained until he's handed over appropriately. Totally relaxed. Yeah. So I don't want to let you off the hook with the swordsman. So okay. your your um you notice certain changes in behaviour. Presumably you called out some of those changes. Did it work? What was the response that he gave you? <laughs> well, no, the first few times, yeah. Um we added in some of these suggestions that um he's thinking about giving himself up. They were declined, not so politely. The more we labelled though, the more that we saw the more he then started to listen to our suggestions. I mean, first of all, you get the no abuse, from abuse to no abuse, and then you'll you'll have words like, well, maybe I am, or could be thinking about that. So it's, it's a progressive acceptance, if you like, of our suggestions, but it required lots of the labelling of, of what we were seeing. And he rewards you for getting it right, doesn't he, really, eventually? Eventually. And, and what about, what, what are you going through at that time? What what are you what are you thinking and feeling at that particular time when things are clearly changing? You've been there you've been there a while. Your emotions are probably changing. You're not in the same emotional state as when you turned up. You've got some sort of relationship with this guy now. How did that impact upon how you be then communicated with him from that point on? Your your own emotions shift um, when you turn up. You're anxious. You might be scared. Um, I mean, climbing up a crane in central London is not a nice thing to do, um, mm. but we've we've both had to do that. Um, nervous, worried that it will end in disaster, that you're not good enough. But invariably, you end up actually quite happy um, that you've actually solved the incident with, with no injury. So you can go through uh, fear to joyfulness, um, whilst dealing with the incident. So, I mean, the last thing I want to do is talk to somebody who's in a crisis when I'm angry. You know, I haven't got the patience or energy to talk about another's emotions um, if if my own are so intense. So it, it's not just naming it. We have to unpack the emotion, um, you know, that, that we've identified uh, as well. Um, and I suggest one of the reasons we don't label another person's emotion is because it's such hard work and effort. So I need to label myself before I emotional label others, because I know I'm going to have to talk about those feelings afterwards. So by labeling my own feelings, um, I'm giving my brain a chance, if you like, to make sense of my own feelings. You know, what am I experiencing before I talk to this person? Because it can be a real barrier to my ability to communicate with that person if I'm going through too many emotions myself. Yeah, I was just going to say, they, they just get in the way, don't they? Yeah. And it's interesting, actually, because it, it, one thing that we never really highlight is is just how tiring this all is. And it needs it needs real – you've got to have energy to – to properly listen and take on, if you like, somebody else's emotions. Not take them into yourself, but, you know, try and identify them. Because as we've, as we've both mentioned with your swordsman and the flat, until we've got the emotion out there, we, we can't deal with them. I mean, I, I can well remember a particular team member of mine um, at work had some real issues that were affecting life. And it was, a, it was genuinely a very brave thing to do. It involved all sorts of difficulties in private life that were impacting upon work. Um, mm. But if I wasn't in the right frame of mind, I'm not doing that, that person justice. No. Um, because I, as you say, I, because I'm emotional um, or my head's, my head's not in the right space. And, and, that is, and that is a real barrier. So it's always best to understand what's going on with you first and deal with that um, internally before you can effectively um, be that person for somebody else. I mean, I, would, I knew those conversations were coming and I may have had a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, get some fresh air. Just reset before having that conversation, um, because if you don't, it's it's going to be very very difficult. Um, yeah, the, having the energy to engage, which is why we can't do this twenty four hours a day, can we? No, and people go through uh, like your person that you spoke to at work there, and my swordsman. They they can go through a range of emotions in one incident, and in workplace conversations, you can a person can go through a whole gamut of emotions in such a short space of time. 
And it's important in those conversations that you, wherever there's a shift, so if someone starts off by being upset and they shift to anger, we call that out. Do you do that every time? Because, I mean, that that's quite common, isn't it? People, people who are really, really angry, um, yeah. quite often anger is a front for something else that's going on. It could be fear or it could be betrayal or um, a grievance. It's quite often fear, actually. Anger quite often masks fear, doesn't it? I mean, would you, once that begins to come out, and I, let's say I display four or five different emotions in, in a, you said short space time, in a minute or two, how would you how would you respond to that? Well, that tends not to happen, a, a, a shift so frequently in a short space of time, but I'd call that big shifts. So as right. an example, you start talking to somebody and they're incredibly angry. If there then comes a point in a conversation where there's a big shift to say crying and visibly upset, that's a real big shift from being anger, angry to being upset. And if it's significant, call it out. So initially you sound angry, the person will tell me why, and then there's a shift. Or I might become depressed or morose. Then, yeah, call that out. What 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 is it that's made that shift? Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't call out that shift, you are still – talking to that person with the last emotion that you've labeled as anger when it's clear to everybody that's in the room that's no longer the case so let's see what we're dealing with now you sound upset now now if the person then agrees and says yes i am upset clearly you'll go on to validate as we've called we've mentioned and we'll go on to question why but unless we again call out that shift we're sort of talking in the past, aren't we? We're talking about past emotions. And in the, and within 30 minutes of a well-being conversation in the workplace, you'll get those shifts. Mm. And I would suggest it's our job, if we're talking to this person, to, to actually call call those shifts out. Yeah, and, and it's something else that always occurs to me is that, you know, this desire to get to a result. And it, it's it's not a failure on anybody's part to leave that well-being conversation with people still no. feeling strong emotions it's not it's not going to all of a sudden be nicely packaged and wrapped up in a mm -hmm. bow and everything's okay uh, you know we're not therapists we're not going to solve everything but the important thing is to listen properly um which is hard work and to make that effort in attempting to identify what somebody's really feeling mm. and then as you mentioned before we follow up with questions and other techniques that we'll discuss at other times um, and it's part of a suite of techniques that are available to us that might move things forward in addition to the emotional labeling but the fact that we've been able to identify emotions to be able to talk about them enables people to feel heard i know i do if if somebody gets it right i'm i'm feeling that i'm being listened to um and that's yeah. you know that's a, a really important step forward but i may not actually go away with the problem solved but that's that's not that's not really our objective i don't think all the time you know it's, and it's interesting you know going back to the the the, uh, the chat with the sword you know conversations as well with the likes of him workplace conversations how do you think they sort of map across with talking to friends family uh, people that we're close to is it the same well actually i think there's often a barrier with people you're very familiar with, um, your loved ones at home, uh, family members, uh, your best friend. Because those who are close to us, we often assume we know what they're feeling because we know them so well, don't we? Um, we know how they think. Um, so then we can subconsciously make us feel that, well, emotional labor is a waste of time um, because I know what makes them angry. And then we tend to then use passive aggressive tones and sentences rather than enabling what we think. We sort of tell the person uh, what the emotion is and the cause. So an example might be, oh, Chris, I see your, your wife's made you angry again, rather than saying, oh, Chris, you sound angry. And then you tell me, first of all, whether I'm right. And secondly, what the reason is. 
Now, if you come back to me and say, yeah, my wife's made me angry again, well, at least you've told me that's the case. I haven't told you mm. that that's the case. That's, that's the big difference here. Um, and why is that so important? Because then you've been heard rather right. than that, – that's listening mm. rather than telling. Um, and so that's a barrier, the, the familiarity. This, that's one of the reasons why – I mean, if you went home every day – and every time that your wife spoke to you, you called out and labelled her emotions. She'd probably think there's something wrong with you because yeah. you don't do it. <laughs> She'd probably think you're having an affair or something mm. um, because you don't do it because you you probably, like I said, without repeating myself, but I will, um, you probably think you know what the emotion is. Mm. Um, so that's a barrier. And to complement the other barrier which we've talked about, which is, if you are too emotional yourself, you haven't got yeah. the energy to call out someone else's emotions. And that's why when you come home from work after a long day at work, mm. you've got two barriers playing against you. The one of familiarity and the other one is you're exhausted from your commute coming home. The last thing you have energy for is to talk about other people's emotions. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why so many domestic situations go toxic at that time. Because mm. you get the whole, well, you think you've had a bad day exactly. scenario playing out. It's never a good time to uh, to discuss no. important things. And we'll, we'll talk about when is a good time uh, on, on in, in other podcasts, uh, because that's important too, about planning planning conversations that might be difficult and stopping them from being really toxic. I said I didn't want to let you off the hook, and I'm not going to. What happened with the swordsman? Well, lots of listening, lots of emotional labelling uh, and other techniques. He did surrender, um, mm -hmm. placed his sword down. Yes, an emotional labelling helped for sure, but you know it's only a small element of active listening, um, and we have to combine it with all the other techniques that we are going to discuss, I know, in uh, our other podcasts. Um, so to summarise then, what we talked about today and what we're going to take away from it. I mean, for me, Chris, the, the, the key single point to remember is when people are highly emotional, they're not listening. So we're going to point out what we're seeing and hearing to give ourselves uh, a platform to move forward. So we call it out, we name it to tame it. And we realize that our own emotions, how our own emotions can affect how we listen to others. So we name them also. We recognize and point out the shifts in emotions during conversations. And we, we can also label what we see. Um, what we think is important to the other person and what behavior uh, we're actually seeing. Not the easiest thing in the world. It sounds like it, you know, takes some practice. I'm Chris White, and that's Martin Richards on the Convincing Conversations podcast. Today, we've been talking about emotional labeling, labeling the emotion that you see, hear, or experience. If you like what you've heard today, please do leave us a message or a review wherever you hear this podcast. Share it with friends. And you never know, it might help you and them have better conversations. It really can make a difference. In the next Convincing Conversations podcast, we're going to talk about another technique called mirroring. Mirroring. It's a fantastic skill to use when actually when you feel overwhelmed. You don't know what to say. You don't know where to go next or, or even how to steer a conversation or want to pick out and develop hooks in a subtle way when somebody might not even know you're doing it. So Lovely. See you again. See you again.